morning, last day of lectures. <laughs> and we'll start with final lecture in Bruce Averland's course. Good morning. Okay. So I, know, I realize it's been a long time since the previous lecture. It seems like a long time anyway, after the excursion yesterday and all the hard work last night. So if anyone needs to be reminded of anything that I've said in the previous lectures or if there's any notation I use that uh, you want to be reminded of, please speak up. Okay. All right, so in the, in the last lecture, we defined the Satote group and we were starting to try to understand some of its properties. And I stated a theorem um, about the component group of the Satote group, which I want to restate now and just give a very quick sketch of the proof. Okay, so, theorem. So we have uh, an abelian variety over a number field K. There exists a unique finite Galois extension Uh, that's unramified outside of the bad primes of such that the Galois group of L over K is isomorphic to the component group of the Sato Tate group. So I put a little zero here. I'm taking the that's the identity component. Uh, moreover, for each uh, subextension of f of k inside l of k, the Galois group of l over f is isomorphic to the, sadotate, the component group of the sadotate group of the base change of A to F. I think when I stated it in the previous lecture, I forgot to include the subscript here. Okay. So we have sort of a, a functorial relationship between the, the uh, lattice of uh, Gower groups and the subgroups of the uh, sadotate group. Okay, so I'll just give a very short sketch of this proof. So those who want to see the details, I'll give you the exact section number in Sarah's lectures on NX of P. Okay, so um, we're going to let S sub L be uh, our set of bad primes plus the prime L that we used to define the Sato Tate group. And let uh, K S sub L um, sitting inside our fixed algebraic closure, let this be uh, the maximal and ramified extension outside of SL. And let's uh, write gamma L for the Galois group. KSL over K. So there's a natural homomorphism from this Gower group, so it's continuous, and it's surjective onto the component group of the elatic monodromy group. So recall this is the Zariski closure of the image of uh, the absolute Gower group under our elatic representation. So here I'm gonna put a little zero here for the component group or the identity component of this algebraic group. So these are algebraic groups over QL. Um, so this is surjective, and the kernel is open. And of course, the kernel is also normal in a finite index. Um, and if we now consider, let's take L to be the uh, fixed field corresponding to this kernel. Give that a name, gamma naught. So this is a finite Galois extension. Unramified outside of 
as Sabel. Moreover, and this is uh, proved, actually I think it's in a letter or a series of letters from Sarah to Ribbit. Um, the field L does actually does not depend on, it, on little l. So in particular, we could vary little l without changing big L, so this tells us that it's unramified outside of S. Okay, and then as Sarah shows, it's, and this, this part is not difficult, um, we have isomorphisms. This one's obvious, but we can extend these two. And the, so that proves the first claim in the theorem. And then the exact same argument applies to the base change, to any base change we want to take. Okay, and I'll just remark this. So, that, so this field L is, is canonical and uh, gives us the component group of the Satote group and doesn't depend on either the, the prime L or the embedding that we chose when we defined the Satote group. And I'll just uh, remark that um, we always have the, the endomorphisms, if we base change A to this field L, we get all the endomorphisms of our abelian variety. That's always true. This follows from a theorem of Bogomolov and Faltings. Um, and for G less than or equal to three, L is the smallest such field. Meaning we could take as an alternative definition of the field L, the minimal field extension over which all the anamorphisms of A are defined. Yes. Um, not that I'm aware of, although I, that doesn't mean it's not possible. So this is something that I think is worth thinking about. I mean, in any particular, sorry. So the question was, do we have any explicit construction of this field L? So in any particular examples, it's not hard. To, once you know this constraint on the ramification, it's not difficult to figure out what L is. Um, but as a computational number theorist, I would very much like an algorithm into which I could feed an abelian variety, or probably the, a curve, and the, uh, giving the uh, abelian variety as its Jacobian, that would just spit out this field L. Okay, that's something that, but that's something that still requires some further work. Okay, okay if it's short, because I don't want to run out of time. Yeah, why don't you, why don't you defer it? Okay, all right. Okay. So now I want to switch to a new but related topic, which is the Sato-Tate axioms. So these are a set of axioms laid out by Sayre that any plausible Sato-Tate group ought to satisfy. Okay. So I'm going to only specify these for, the, for simplicity in the case for Sato-Tate groups of abelian varieties, but Sayre gives a much more general definition, which we're going to specialize. So we'll say a group so uh, maybe I'll make that explicit. So group G satisfies, satisfies the Sato-Tate axioms if the following hold. So the first one, which is really um, I'll call the Lie condition. This is just telling us that our group G is going to be a compact Lie group says that G is a closed subgroup of USP to G. And here I should fix 
satisfies the Sato Tate axioms, say, for dimension G. because we're fixing the dimension up front. Mm -hmm. And then the next condition is known as the Hodge condition. So recall, um, when we defined the Hodge group of an abelian variety, um, we introduced the notion of a, a Hodge circle, and it had, uh, the Im we had the image of the Hodge circle landing in the identity component of the Hodge group. So just recall. So we have a homo continuous homomorphism from U1 into G0, and it has the property that if we take the image of any element, it has eigenvalues U and U inverse, each with multiplicity G. And these correspond to the Hodge numbers of the abelian variety. Um, and the Hodge condition says that the Hodge circles, so the, the Hodge circle, by Hodge circle, I mean the image of one of these homomorphisms. The Hodge circles generate a dense subgroup. Of, of the identity component. And when I say this, I should, maybe I should say, and there is at least one, so we, you don't get to generate the trivial group. And then the third Sautertate axiom, this is the rationality condition. And this says that for each component, of our group G, and each irreducible character chi of GL2 G, C, um, if we integrate over the, just the component, not over the whole group, integrate our character against our Haar measure, we get an integer. So here. Okay, and I'll just remark that um, if G is connected, then ST3, this third Sautertate axiom, is automatic. Okay, this is just from representation theory, but when G is not connected, this is a stronger condition that we, we want to have in integer values on each component. Um, and then the second remark I'll make, and you can ignore this if uh, you're not interested, but for, I know that some are, um, you can uh, just describe how one generalizes this um, for general motives, well, say, pure self-dual rational coefficients. Um, the Sautertate axioms look essentially the same. Um, the input is, so we have uh, an input as a uh, weight W. We have Hodge numbers. H, P, Q, which we're assuming by our self-duality that H, this is equal to H, Q, P with P plus Q equal to weight, and we have a dimension D, which is just the sum of the Hodge numbers. And then the only change is that in the first Sautertate axiom, um, there are two possibilities now, depending on whether the weight is odd or even. In the odd weight case, which is the case we're in, we wind up in USP. In the even weight case, we wind up in the orthogonal group. And in the second uh, Sautertate axiom, we just change the definition of a Hodge circle, or generalize the definition. So now we want to have eigenvalues u to the p minus q um, with multiplicity given by the Hodge number, hpq. So for, uh, in the case of abelian varieties, um, we have W is equal to one, we just have two non-trivial Hodge numbers, and they're both equal to G. And so the dimension is 2G. Okay. Any questions on the axioms? These are clear. Um, now, 
given that we're setting these forth as axioms for a Sato take group, one might ask, is the Sato take group that we've just defined, does it actually satisfy these axioms? It actually proves to be not a completely trivial thing to, to show, and it's not known in general, but it is at least known for G less than or equal to three. So I'll just note theorem. Um, and this is uh, really due to Kedlai and Banajak. Um, if A satisfies the uh, Mumford-Tate conjecture and the algebraic Sato-Tate conjecture that I mentioned last time, recall that this algebraic Sato-Tate group is a generalization of the Mumford-Tate group that also accounts for the components, the component group. Okay, in any situation where these conjectures are known to hold, then the Sato-Tate group of A satisfies the Sato-Tate axiom. And this applies in particular for all G less than or equal to three. And in many specific cases with G greater than three. All right, but the thing that makes the Sato-Tate axioms particularly interesting to us um, is the following. And you can find the argument here in, in uh, FKRS, the, the paper with Fite, Kedlaya, Roche, and myself. Um, for any fixed genus G, um, up to conjugacy in USP2G. Only finitely many G satisfy the Sautotate axioms. Okay, so that actually naturally leads to a classification problem. As soon as we know there's a finite list of something, we'd like to know what that finite list is. So let's go ahead and do the classification, solve the classification problem for G equals one. So, so for G equals one, um, there are just three groups that satisfy the Sautotate axioms, groups we've already seen before. I'll just remind you that when I write U1, I'm embedding U1 in USP2, which is the same as SU2, like this. Second possibility is the normalizer of, U, of this U, embedded U1 inside SU2, or I could get all of SU2. Okay. These are the only possibilities. Okay, so the proof, very quick and easy. Um, so the first Sautotate axiom tells us that the, our identity component, um, sorry, not the first Sautotate axiom, the second Sautotate axiom, the Hodge condition, tells us that the identity component contains, uh, or up to conjugacy, contains a copy of U1 inside it. And this implies that either the identity component is equal to U1, or the identity component has to be SU2. This is just from the classification of compact connected Lie groups. Those are the only possibilities. And if the identity component is U1, well, we know that um, the identity component is a normal subgroup of G. So G has to be inside the normalizer. Okay. Um, and we'll just note that the index, that U1 has index two inside its normalizer in SU2. So there's only two possibilities for G, the two that I've written down. And otherwise, the identity component is just SU2, uh, we, and it's connected. Okay. And so then as a corollary, um, for G equals one, G satisfies the Sautotate axioms if and only if G is actually a Sautotate group of some elliptic curve over a number field. Okay. It would be wonderful if that were true in general, but it's not. Okay. 
But here's what we can say. We know the answer in completely in uh, Genus 2. Um, so this is... Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, so up to conjugacy, of course. Um, there are 55 subgroups of USP4 that satisfy the Sautertate axioms for G equals 2. Of these, so that's statement 1, <laughs> statement 2, of these, 52 arise as the Sautertate group of an abelian variety over a number field. And of those, 34 arise when k is equal to q. Okay. And I'll say a few words about how this theorem is pro proved in, an, in a moment. Um, I'll just note for those who are interested, the three that are missing is all have um, identity component U1 cross U1. Okay, and one of these was ruled out quite early on by, by Sayre, but to get to rule out all three of them, we rely on a matching between cytotate groups and Galois endomorphism types, which I want to introduce in a moment, that shows us that the other three cases can't, can't occur. Okay. So to... To prove this theorem, the key ingredient is a new notion of Galois endomorphism module of a, an abelian variety. So just to motivate this, recall that when we define the Munford Tate group, um, which determines the identity component of the Sato Tate group, uh, we defined it in terms of this R algebra, this, uh, the endomorphism of gamma R, right? So we had where gamma here was the um, lattice of our complex corresponding to our, the complex torus, isomorphic to our polarizable complex torus, isomorphic to our abelian variety. And we've already just seen and, and seen and sketched the proof of uh, associating a Galois group to the component group. So we have an R algebra, we have a Galois group. Now we'd like to tie these two things together and make the definition uh, more intrinsic to our abelian variety. So maybe I'll switch to a new piece of paper. Okay. So we're gonna work um, in a category I'll just denote C Galois endomorphism modules. So its objects are pairs GE, where G is a finite group, E is an R algebra, and G acts on R. So the R algebra is equipped with a G action. Sorry, it acts on E, our endomorphism algebra. So E now, for this page, E is an endomorphism algebra, not a uh, elliptic curve. Uh, and the morphisms in our category are exactly what you expect. So we have a, a pair um, of morphisms where V sub G is a homomorphism of groups, V sub E is a homomorphism of R algebras, and they need to be compatible. And then that means that um, if we took an element, say G, of the group, let it act on an element of the endomorphism algebra, and then mapped over to E prime, we should get the same thing as if we first mapped our endomorphism over to E prime, and then let mapped our G over and let it act. Okay, so they're compatible. And then given an abelian variety over a number field, um, we'll let L over K be the minimal extension 
where all the anamorphisms are defined. And this is necessarily a finite Galois extension. Um, so let G be the uh, Galois group. And we're going to let our endomorphism algebra, E, this will be um, the real endomorphism algebra of our base change of A to this field where all of its endomorphisms are defined. Okay. And so then the pair, and so we have a, a natural action of the Galois group on the endomorphism ring, and that carries, induces an action on the real endomorphism algebra. And so we get a uh, element of our category, an object in our category. And now we're going to define the Galois endomorphism type, which I'll denote uh, GT of A, is as the isomorphism class in this in our category. So I have to note it with brackets to indicate it's an isomorphism class of this pair. Okay, so for each abelian variety, we get a Galois endomorphism type. Okay. Um, and I should just note, or maybe I should have, I think this is probably obvious from the definitions, but um, just as a warning, if, I have an isom if G is isomorphic to G prime and E is isomorphic to E prime, this does not imply that these isomorphism classes are equal. Okay, because the actions might be different. And we see that happen already when G is two. Okay. So let's just uh, work out an example in our favorite setting where now E is going to be an elliptic curve again. <laughs> okay, so for elliptic curves, Well, what are the possibilities for the real endomorphism algebra? Well, this is either going to be R, that happens when we have no CM, or it's going to be C, and that happens when we have CM, because recall that the, the endomorphism ring for CM is an order in an imaginary quadratic field, and when we tensor with R, we're going to get C. Um, and the Galois group, the minimal field over which all the endomorphisms defined is either K itself or a quadratic extension. And so the Galois group is going to be either the trivial group. This, is, this happens in two situations. Either we have no CM or we already have CM over the, the base field. Or we get a cyclic group of order two. This is when we have CM not defined over K. And so this tells us that there are three possibilities for the... Um, Galois endomorphism type of an elliptic curve. We could have the pair of the trivial group with the R algebra C. That's when we have CM over K. We could have the cyclic group of order two together with the R algebra C. This is when we have CM not over K, not defined over K. Or we could have the trivial group and the R algebra R. This is when we have no CM. Okay, and so as a as a corollary of our, in our, as of our example, we note that in, for G equals one, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between Sauter-Tate groups and Galois endomorphism types. We can match them up on both sides. Okay. Okay, and that statement generalizes. Okay, so next theorem. This is also uh, an FKRS. Um, so let's see. Let uh, A be an abelian variety over a number field K, um, dimension G less than or equal to 3. And let L over K be our minimal, usual minimal extension where all the anamorphisms defined.
And so first statement is that the cytotate group of A determines the GABA endomorphism type of A. And we can say something finer, the identity component of the cytotate group, even if we forget everything else, is enough to distinct to tell us what the real endomorphism algebra is. And as we've already seen, the component group um, is isomorphic to this gamma group, because L is also the minimal extension over which we get a connected uh, cytotate group. And I'll just mention some converses. So the, 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 the strongest statement here, we know that the converse is true for G less than or equal to two. We just proved it for one, and it's proved for two. We believe it to be true for three, but some work is required to finish that. Um, this statement is known, the converse is known for G less than or equal to three. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between Galois anamorphism types and uh, connected cytotate groups. And this, of course, holds for any G. Okay. Um, just a remark, the uh, converse, both of uh, these converses um, does not hold for G greater than three. And we know this due to an example constructed by Mumford. Um, for G equals four, he constructs an abelian fourfold that has trivial endomorphism ring over the algebraic closure. But nevertheless, the Mumford Tate group is smaller than it could be. So the Mumford Tate group is not all of GSP to G. Um, and this implies that the Sato Tate group is going to be not all of USP to G. Okay. And note in that implication, we're just we're not depending on the Mumford Tate conjecture. We're just using the fact that the, the Deline, the containment that Deline proved. Okay. All right. It would be very nice. So there's a lot of interest in this exceptional example of Mumford. I'll just mention as a, as an open problem. It would be really wonderful to have an explicit example. And by explicit, I mean give me say a genus four curve that I can write down whose Jacobian exhibits exactly this this property. We actually know what the connected component of the identity of the cytotate group should be in this case, but we don't really know what its uh, component group should be. And it would be wonderful to have some explicit examples. So problem to work on. Okay, so now we can, um, I wanna come back to this uh, classification theorem, um, sorry, of the 52 Galois endomorphism types that we noted here, or the, the 52 Sautertate groups that arise for an abelian variety over K, those correspond to the 52 Galois endomorphism types that can arise, and that's how you prove the theorem. You have this one, you prove that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between Galois endomorphism types and Sautertate groups, and then you show that there are only 52 Galois endomorphism types, so there can only be 52 Sautertate groups. I'm not gonna give you the, the full list, I'll refer you to the paper that, but I'll at least um, show how things break out in terms of the identity components. Okay, because this will also give us perhaps some better in understanding or intuition about the Sautertate group. So I'm gonna, for each type of um, Sautertate group, or endomor Galois endomorphism type, the uh, real endomorphism algebra, and the identity component of the Sato Tate group correspond. So there are six possibilities, but these arise for a variety, uh, quite a range of different types of abelian varieties. So one example would be we could have an abelian variety that's isogenous over Q bar to the square of a CM elliptic curve. Okay, in this case, the real endomorphism algebra is gonna be as complicated as it could be. It's gonna look like two by two matrices over C and the Sautertate group is gonna be U1 sub two. So it's isomorphic to U1, but I'm embedding the U1 that I already defined for you in SU2 you know, along the diagonal of USP4, so two copy, identical copies of it. Okay. Next case we could have is, um, we could have a Q, uh, a, an abelian surface with court, um, quaternion multiplication, so QM abelian surface. So these are simple over Q bar. Or we could also have the square of a non-CM elliptic curve. And in both cases, the real endomorphism algebra is gonna be the same. It's gonna look by two by two matrices over R. And the Sato Tate group is gonna be a diagonally embedded SU2 sitting inside USP4. 
Next possibility is we could have a CM abelian surface. Again, this is going to be simple uh, over Q bar. Or we could have a product of CM elliptic curves. And in both cases, the real anamorphism algebra is going to be isomorphic to C cross C, and the Sato-Tate group is going to look like, oops, sorry, no subscript there, just U1 cross U1. Okay. And we could have a real multiplication, an abelian surface with real multiplication, also simple. Or we could have a product, say E1 cross E2, where these are non-isogenous, um, non-CM elliptic curves. And I realize I wrote these not quite in the order I wanted, but that's okay. So this is going to be SU2 cross SU2. We could have the product of a CM elliptic curve E1 and a non-CM elliptic curve E2. And then the real endomorphism algebra would look like C cross R, and we would get SU2 cross U1. And then finally, we could have a, a billion variety of generic type, general type. So the endomorphism would be Z, the real endomorphism algebra would be R, and the Sato-Tate group would be all of USP4. Okay. So there's six possibilities here. Um, and I'll notice that uh, I'll note that in terms of connected groups, these are also the only six connected groups that satisfy the Sato-Tate axiom. That for those of you familiar with the classification of, of Lie groups, you might wonder why U2 is not on this list because you can embed U2 inside USP4. And the Hodge condition is what prevents U2 from showing up in this list. But if you consider motives of different weight, so for example, in, in weight three, it's possible to get a Sato-Tate group with identity component U2, and it's actually possible to realize that Sato-Tate group uh, as a Sato-Tate group of a motive. Okay. Question, yeah. Yes, well, from this list, you can at least get the identity component. If you know, if you, on the left-hand side, if you know where you are on the left-hand side here, you know the identity component of the Sato-Tate group. In that this and this is in, in for G equals two. It's also true in genus three, and I'll, I'll maybe at the end if I have time I'll show the breakdown there. I, but I put it into the notes. So in genus three, there are 15 possible connected Sato-Tate groups, corresponding to 15 possible um, endomorph real endomorphism algebras that can arise. And you can break down, and there's a lot more than 15 types of abelian threefolds, but you can categorize them and match them up. So I'll refer you to the lecture notes for that. Sure, just take a product of his abelian fourfold with something else. Yeah. Interesting question whether there are less trivial ways of doing that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. In um, genus, one thing I'll note in genus three is that um, it's very, very, it's very important to understand that we should really be thinking of the Sato Tate group in some sense as a representation of an abstract group. It's very specific, uh, very important to remember that we're talking about a concrete realization which we think of as a representation of an embedding of this sato -tay group inside USP2G. So for example, in genus three, one can have uh, uh, sato -tay groups whose identity components are isomorphic as compact Lie groups. Say they both look like U1 cross SU2, but they're embedded differently. One of them is a U1 sub two cross SU2, and the other one is a U1 cross SU2 sub two. Okay. And they give rise to different trace distributions, so you can see this difference. Okay, so I'm going to run through, I think I'm going to be a little bit quick on this last part because I want to have time to show you some pictures. But now that we um, know a little bit more about sato -tay groups, so the construction of the sato -tay group didn't say anything about equidistribution, but of course our motivation was we'd like to be able to test the sato -tay conjecture, see if we actually have equidistribution. So in order to do that, once we figured out what the Sato-Tay group is, we want to know what its Haar measure is. So then we can actually run experiments and compare the results with what we uh, would get if we integrated according to Haar measure. So let me just note some of the Sato-Tay measures that we've already computed in previous lectures. So for in genus one, for U1, we just had 
uh, uniformly distributed eigenangles. So here, the eigenangle runs from zero to pi. D theta is just a Lebesgue measure. And for SU2, we get two over pi sine squared theta d theta. And then in genus two, so for the six identity components, it's easy to write down five of them. So if we just embed, or diagonally embed two cop identical copies of our U1, we're gonna get exactly the same measure. Right? But I should note that the trace distribution is gonna be different because we have two copies of U1 and the trace is gonna get doubled. So the moments are gonna change, but we can, it's easy to see exactly what they are. Just multiply each moment by two to the, the nth moment by two to the n. And similarly for our um, embedded, diagonally embedded SU2, it's just the same thing. And then if we wanted to take uh, any of these products, maybe I won't write them all down because it's, it's obvious what to do, um, we just take the product of the measures because we should think of these as sort of independent, independently varying uh, pairs because we have non, these correspond to a product of non-isogenous things. So I won't bother writing all of these. Maybe I'll write the... If I had the product of elliptic curves or an abelian uh, surface with real multiplication, I would get something that looked like this. Okay, so here our eigenangles, theta one, theta two, are both going from zero to pi. And then, but now the USP4 case requires more work. It doesn't just fall out from things we already know. So I'll write it down in this particular example but this is a, a result of the vial integration formulas, which I wanna share with you in a moment. And so this is just a special case of the following formula, and vial worked these out for all the classical groups. So he, what he worked out is the measure induced by the Haar measure, the push forward of the Haar measure onto conjugacy classes where we're parameterizing conjugacy classes in terms of uh, their eigenangles. So for USP, you get the following formula. So it's one over G factorial product one less than J less than K. Okay. And so there are G eigenangles, and they're all ranging from zero to pi. Okay. So you can figure out the Haar measure for, for USP anything, and there are similar formulas for the unitary group, the orthogonal ensembles, and various others. Um, now, once you know the Haar measure on the identity component, you can compute the distribution for any Sadotate group with that identity component just by uh, summing over the components. So recall, we defined our measure as a linear functional on the continuous functions on the, in the Bonnock space associated to the set of conjugacy classes of our abelian variety, or of our, heart, our compact group, sorry. Um, the Sadotate group in this case. So here, are the, uh, the G's, um, these are coset reps. Okay. So it's easy, and this is, these are all worked out for the 52 cases that I mentioned in genus two, and so it's not hard once you know the identity, the Sadotate group to work out what the corresponding measure is. And then one can go and test, perform computational experiments to see if you're seeing the equidistribution you want. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and jump into that, seeing as I'm getting, I have five minutes left and I wanna spend some time in the pictures. Um, but I'll refer you to the notes for um, explicit formulas, determinental formulas that allow you to compute. So here I just focused on the 
uh, measures for the trace, but uh, there are determinal, determinantal formulas that you can write down that will allow you to compute the measure corresponding to, and the moment sequence corresponding to um, any power sum of the eigen, eigenvalues. And you can use that to then derive um, moment, the moment sequences for any uh, symmetric polynomial in the eigenvalues. Okay, so I'll refer you to, this is a paper by uh, Kieran and myself from 2009, which is cited in the notes. Okay. Okay. Oop, did we not come up? We up. Okay, good. All right, so if you go to uh, my webpage uh, under G2 Sato Tate distributions, you can find a list of all of the 52 Sato Tate groups that can arise for an abelian surface. In addition, you can find an explicit uh, abelian variety that realizes that Sato Tate group expressed as the Jacobian of a, hyper, of a hyperelliptic curve. In some cases, and in fact, all these hyperelliptic curves are actually defined over Q, but in some cases, we're taking base changes to get the Sato Tate group, which is necessary because only 34 of them can be realized over Q. Um, and let's just take a look at one of these. So here, what you're seeing is a Sato Tate histogram that's exactly analogous to the one we saw for our elliptic curves in earlier lectures. Um, this is for the trace, and you'll see that the, the uh, x-axis runs from now from minus four to four because the way bounds change as we increase the dimension. And we're doing the same thing. We're computing uh, normalized del polynomials, pulling out the, the linear coefficient, A1, and then plotting a histogram where we subdivide this x-axis up into subintervals. And you'll see that we get a, a shape that's no longer a semicircle, but this is exactly the shape you would get if you integrated against the Haar measure for USP4. And the moment sequence I'll note down here, 10103, 1484, 594, those are a two-dimensional analog of the Catalan numbers. You can think of the Catalan numbers as counting uh, returning walks to the origin on an in integer lattice of dimension one that always stay to the right of the origin. Okay, if the, if, if the returning walk has length n, there are none if n is odd, so that's why you always get zero for the odd n, and then for the even ones, you get the nth Catalan number, or the n over two Catalan number. In two dimensions, this, this sequence, these moments are counting returning walks to the origin on a two-dimensional integer lattice, that satisfy the x coordinate is greater than or equal to the y coordinate that is greater than or equal to zero. In other words, it's staying inside this triangle. Oh, sorry. That triangle. <laughs> Um, and that is actually the, for those who are, uh, know a little bit about uh, Lie groups, that is actually the vial chamber associated to USP4. Okay? And this generalizes. So in arbitrary dimension, um, the, if you look at the mom tr moments of the trace for USP2G, they're going to be counting returning walks to the origin that's, that are bounded within a vial chamber. And an interesting question is to look, and I put one of these in the exercises for each of these six connected groups, one can similarly give um, combinatorial interpretations of their trace moment sequences as counting random walks, of, or, or counting returning walks to the origin subject to certain constraints. Now that we're in dimension two, we have more than one L polynomial coefficient that we could look at. And of course, we could look at other symmetric functions of the eigenvalues. These are just two that I've picked. So this is the, remember the, uh, the normalized L polynomial is going to have degree four. It has two interesting coefficients, A1 and A2. A2 is the middle one, the quadratic coefficient. And here you see the Sato Tate distribution. Now the x-axis is running from minus six to six. The gray line is showing the height of the uniform distribution for scale. And you'll see again, we get integer moments as we should expect. And now the odd moments aren't all zero. Okay, so that's one of the reasons I, I show these. Um, one can even do the same thing, or well, maybe I should show some exceptional cases before I do that. So let's go look at some of these, um, maybe more interesting, I don't know, maybe this one. So here's a particular uh, hyperlyptic curve, genus two over the field Q join the square root of minus three. And it's Sato Tate group, the component group is dihedral of order 12. And this is the Sato Tate distribution you get. And you can see that there are many different component distributions being overlaid on top of each other in this picture. So often just by looking at the Sato Tate histogram, you can, you can see components, not always. Um, and you'll also notice the moments are a lot bigger. Okay, that's 
typical. One can then do the following experiment. We said we wanted to test the Sadotay conjecture in its refined form. So for a particular Sadotay group, we know the Haar measure. We can integrate, um, we can, so the blue line there sh shows what, you, what the Haar measure on the Sadotay group predicts. And the green histogram is showing a Sadotay histogram up to, uh, I think in this case, maybe primes up to 2 to the 12th. So the green doesn't match the blue very well. But as you increase the, the, the norm bound on your primes, the green histogram very nicely fills in the blue curve given by the Haar measure. And one can do this for all of the Sadotay groups. And you find that you get an essentially perfect match in every case. In fact, in the, in the paper, we didn't take the precision out as far as we could because when we did, you couldn't tell the, the difference between the green and the blue. Um, and then maybe the last thing I'll show you is just some, well, here's what I'll, I'll do this instead. So here's the, um, here's the table of real endomorphism algebras for abelian threefolds. Here's the classification of different types of abelian threefolds you can get. Here's the Sadote groups. There are 15 of them. They all arise. We have explicit examples that realize all 15 of these cases. The ones in blue are the simple ones. So those of you who are thinking, used to thinking just about simple abelian varieties, you're missing out on a lot of fun. Okay. Um, and I will just show you maybe a picture. Did I put it in here? Oh, no, I left it out of here. Um, so here's, here's a family portrait of all the exceptional A2 distributions that arise for abelian surfaces over Q. Um, and there's a similar picture for the connected abelian threefolds um, that you can find in the, in the lecture notes. And I think I better stop there. Any questions? Well, I have one. Uh, can you go to the rationality condition uh, <clears throat> for the, if you still have that slide? Yeah, sure. The, um, for, in the Sadotate axioms, you mean? Yes. OK, so the Haar measure, do you mean the Haar measure on the whole G or on the component H? Or what Haar measure are we talking about? Well, I mean, they're going to be, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess they're going to be the same. I'm restricting to the Haar measure on the component, which is induced what by the Haar measure the on the group. Because, right, you have the, uh, you change yeah, the normalization. Yes, right? so yeah, yeah, right. fair point, yeah. You're going to change the normalization so that you're going to integrate to one okay. if you integrated everything. Yeah, that, thank you. Yeah. Okay, our questions. Let's thank Drew again.